from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Well, good evening. Welcome to the Library of Congress. I'm John Cole. I'm the director of the Center for the Book in the Library of Congress. I have the wonderful job of promoting books and reading and authors in the name of the Library of Congress. And one of the favorite activities uh, is an event like tonight, where we have a special writer talking about a book that has a strong relationship in many ways uh, to the Library of Congress. Most of the speakers in this series are authors of books that have either been based on the library's collections, a researcher or a historian, or it's an author that has a uh, special connection with the library, uh, with a project, or they've used the li library as a setting. And we're very pleased that, uh, tonight that uh, that is the case. And uh, David will be talking uh, about the connection with the library, so I'm not going to do much of that in the introduction. I would like to say that uh, this talk is uh, co-sponsored with the Rare Book and Special Collections Division, which has a particular connection to the book. Uh, it also, uh, the book also has a special connection to the library's uh, preservation division, uh, preservation office, and you will hear about that in the course of the evening as well. Uh, we have a couple of special guests that I would like to uh, recognize. Uh, Jamie Rabb is the president of Warner Books. And David Young is the CEO of Hatchet, Hatchet Book Group, uh, David's publishers, and they're here tonight, and I'd like you to join me in giving them a brief recognition. Uh, David also uh, has appeared in two of our national book festivals, and one of the other activities in which the Center for the Book is involved is uh, the National Book Festival. We had our sixth festival, September 30th, on the Mall and attracted a crowd of, uh, again, a around 100,000. Uh, we were very pleased. Uh, David has been in two of the book festivals. In the 19, excuse me, in the 2002 festival, he discussed Last Man Standing, at the time his latest thriller. In 2005, he performed Double Duty, discussing our game in the Mysteries and the Thrillers Pavilion and his first children's book, Freddy and the French Fries, Fries Alive, uh, in the Children's Pavilion. And that was a unique occasion and was one in which I'm now going to remember David in many different guises, but uh, he filled in for us in, in the Children's Pavilion and of course did a great job and I thought, well, that's where we should have started with David because we know he's going to be producing more and more thrillers and he'll make return trips uh, to the National Book Festival. The, uh, the Collectors is David's 12th novel. Uh, all of his previous books have been New York Times bestsellers. Uh, he is one of the world's most popular writers. His books have been published in more than 40 languages in more than 80 countries. More than 50 million copies are in print worldwide. And now to talk about The Collectors, a book which features the main reading room of the Library of Congress on the cover, and which inside, on the end papers, uh, actually has the Bay Psalm book, which was bequeathed to the library uh, in 1966, and also plays a, an important part in the plot. To tell us about it, it's my privilege to introduce the author, David Baldacci. David? Thank you for having me here tonight. I have a, a long history with the Library of Congress and the Center for the Book here. I've been a member of the Virginia Center for the Book for a long time and have done many programs with them and also with the Library of Congress, the Center for the Book. Um, it's a great place. I've always wanted to write about it. Um, I'm sorry that it had to do with mayhem and murder, <laughs> but uh, you know, with me, that's sort of my business. John has been a great friend and uh, has done a lot of things with me over the years and always been there when I needed some help on research and um, I just really, uh, treasure his friendship. Now, it's interesting, um, people ask me a lot when I'm out on the road, what is it like to be a best-selling novelist? And I know the way they ask it, they expect some glamorous, glitzy answer. You know, like I get up at noon every day, and I have a favorite smoking jacket that I put on, and I have a furry little dog that I carry under my arm, and 
I go down to my den where a bunch of people wait to write down my every utterance. Now, I, I know writers like that, but I don't happen to be one. So instead, when someone asks me, what is it like to be a number one best-selling novelist, I tell them a true story about my kids. Now, the first time, if you asked my daughter what her dad did for a living when she was three years old, if you asked her what her dad did for a living, she would not say, my dad writes books. She would say, my daddy signs books. <laughs> he writes his name over and over again in books, and for some reason, people pay him to do that. I don't know why. Now, when my son was three years old, um, his sister must have passed down this bit of wisdom to him, because when he was three, I took him to a bookstore for the first time. We walked in, he saw all these people reading books, and he saw all these bookshelves, and his eyes grew really huge, and all of a sudden, he took off running across the store, screaming at the top of his lungs that, my daddy will sign any book you have for $2. <laughs> Apparently, regardless of whether I wrote the book or not, I would sign it and get my $2. I started out uh, as a writer because I loved to read. I would go to my local library every week with my brother and sister and check out far more than I was allowed to because I had secret deals with the librarians. You know, They would let me check out over the limit because they knew I would read the books and I would come back the following week for more. And I'm really only a writer today because I was a reader early in life and I've always been a reader. I started out writing short stories and the reason I did that was primarily one reason. They're short. <laughs> And you can finish them and feel good about yourself, actually, which for a fledgling writer is a very good thing to do. It bolsters your confidence and feels like you've accomplished something. And I would send out these short stories, which I st first started writing when I was in high school and continuing on to college. I would send them out to you know, periodicals, rags, really, you'd never heard of, like The New Yorker, <laughs> you know, Atlantic Monthly, Story Magazine, and even Playboy Magazine, which actually publishes some very fine short fiction in addition to those other things. And I would get lots of rejections back, lots of rejections back over the years. In fact, all I got back were rejections. Now, what are rejections? Well, for me, I've always considered them to be badges of honor. Because as a writer, if you get a rejection, it shows you've done at least two things. One, you have written something and finished it. And for all of you here, and I know you have written things and finished it, it's not that easy to do. It's actually very hard to do. And you've taken this very precious thing that you've created with your blood and your sweat and your tears and you send it off to a complete stranger who will probably do nothing other than completely trash it, even if he or she bothers to read it. And sometimes the complete trashing will have nothing to do with the merits of the work. It could be they just don't like you for some reason, you're actually a good writer and they don't want to acknowledge it, or they just don't like the story material. It could be lots of reasons. So I've always treated them as badges of honor. The only time you lose when you get a rejection is if it dissuades you from following a passion you have in life about something. If a stranger can convince you through a letter that you should not be doing what you're doing, that maybe you shouldn't be doing what you're doing. But if you have that passion, it will carry you through all the inevitable rejections that you will get over the course of your lifetime, no matter what you may be doing, writing or something else. So I persevered. And um, I actually moved into screenplay writing after short stories. I was practicing law in Washington at the time. And a friend of mine went out to Los Angeles to break into film as a producer. Three years later, he came back, not successful, but he brought with him what was then an unproduced screenplay, and he asked me to read it and give him my opinion, and I, and I did. And my opinion was, it sucked. <laughs> you know, there was no story. It was just a series of disjointed vignettes and there was no character development, and the humor in the movie was potty humor. And I was convinced no one would make a film out of this drivel. Austin Powers went on to become an enormous hit. <laughs> really big. I am convinced no one in this room bothered to go see it, but apparently millions of your fellow citizens did, and it became quite a franchise. And I guess it showed I had no taste whatsoever when it came to screenplay writing, but nevertheless, idiot that I am, that I spent the next five years of my life learning how to write screenplays and turned out six or seven of them. Got an agent in LA best, based on those efforts and thought, well, you know what, maybe I'll be a screenwriter at night and a lawyer during the day, and that's how my life will go. And about that time, I finished my very first novel called Absolute Power, um, which turned out to be an enormous success and sort of changed my life in many ways. So I became a bestseller thriller writer sort of in a very circuitous way, but only because I just enjoy telling stories and I sort of persevered over the years. In fact, Absolute Power, after all those years of writing, was really the only piece I'd ever sold. After 15, 16, 17 years of writing, uh, pretty much six days a week, usually at night, to accommodate a career that I had as a lawyer, among other things. 
Well, it's interesting. Now that I'm a published writer and I've written a dozen books and I travel all over the world and all over this country, that combination leads to some interesting results because when I'm out in public, it is very rare that I don't see someone at some point reading one of my books. I'm very rarely on a plane when I don't glance over and see somebody engaged in one of my paperbacks or on a train or by the pool or at a hotel, whatever. I have one critical rule about that. If I ever see you reading one of my books in public, I will never come up to you for a couple of reasons. One, I'm a very private person. I would never want to invade someone else's privacy. And secondly, and far more importantly, if you're not enjoying the book, I don't want to hear about it. <laughs> you know, that's what Amazon.com review boards are for. You can go on there and anonymously trash anybody you want. I remember I went on Amazon a few years ago and looked at one of my books, and a person had given me a one star out of five, which is the worst that you can get. And she was lamenting the fact that Amazon did not allow for zero stars, <laughs> because she would have given me that. And she said, my biggest beef with this book is that I figured it out in the last three pages and therefore found it predictable. <laughs> so from now on, ever since that book, uh, the resolutions of my novels don't actually occur within the pages. Um, they're on the back of the that jacket flap in the rear. And they're written in code that would shame the Da Vinci Code, actually. So if you ever want to get the real scoop, that's where it lies. Well, anyway, I was flying into LAX about six years ago in the middle of a book tour. It was near midnight. I was really tired. And I just wanted to grab my bag and go to my hotel and go to sleep for the next day. And I'm walking down the aisle, and uh, I see this guy standing in the middle of the aisle. And he's got his luggage strewn around him. So he's sort of blocking the aisle, and people are having to walk around him. And he's holding up a book, and he's reading a book. My first reaction was, this poor guy obviously has no life. It's midnight, and he's reading a book standing up by himself in the middle of LAX. My second reaction was one of curiosity. As I walk past him, I look back to see what he was reading. Well, he was reading a copy of Absolute Power. Now my dilemma was sort of obvious. You know, I remember sort of vacillating back and forth. Should I or shouldn't I? I've got this rule that I never do this. And finally, I thought, well, you know, this guy looks all right. So I walked over to him and I said, uh, you know, sir, it really um, looks like you're enjoying that book. And he never lowered the book. I couldn't even see his face. He said, yeah, it's a great book. It's a page turner. I'm really enjoying it. I said, well, I'm actually very glad to hear that. Would you... Um, would you like me to sign it for you? I said. And the book came down a little bit. So I could see his beady little eyes. And the guy looks me up and down in a really, really unflattering way. And he says, uh, no. I don't want you to write your name in my book. So I took a step back. I felt like a fool. And I said, sir, you know, I'm so sorry. I actually have this rule about not doing what I just did. But I saw you reading the book. You said you'd enjoyed it. I just thought you'd like it autographed, you know, because I wrote it. He looks me up and down and again, and he said, uh, <laughs> no, you didn't. <laughs> and I, I took another step back. You know, I'm trying to keep it light and upbeat, and I said, well, you know, actually, it's ironic. Absolute Power was my very first novel. Um, I said, I, I am David Baldacci. Well, then he pointed a finger at me. I won't tell you which one. And he said, look, freak. You're not David Baldacci, and get away from me. <laughs> you know, I can only imagine this happens a lot at LAX. <laughs> you know, hi, I'm John Updike. Would you like me to sign that? <laughs> I'm Mark Twain. I'm dead, but would you like me to sign that? <laughs> well, by this time, a small crowd had gathered around us, you know, I guess waiting for us to start hitting each other. I'm a very nice guy. I treat people very well, very respectfully, and it takes a lot to get me upset, but this bozo <laughs> had pushed all of my buttons way past all of my limits. So I, I said, excuse me, sir, so I reached up and I snatched the book out of his hand. I flipped it around, big picture of me on the back of all my books, thanks to Warner, thank you very much. I held the book up to my face and I said, do you see Buckaroo? <laughs> it's me. So he looks at the picture and he looks at me and he gets a really sheepish expression on his face and he slowly reaches in his pocket, pulls out a pen, and he's looking down at his shoes, he's smiling and he said, Mr. Baldacci, what an honor. <laughs> Would you sign my book, sir, please? I mean, what could I do? I laughed, I slapped him on the back as hard as I possibly could. <laughs> and I said, 
no. I'm not going to write my name in your little book. But I did. I wrote it. So that's just, he's got a good story out of it, and so do I. But trust me, if I ever see you reading one of my books, even if it's the collectors, out in public somewhere, even in front of this library building, don't wait for me to come up and see if you want me to sign my name in it. Now, John mentioned that I'm published in all these foreign languages, and um, it's great. I mean, I, I've always um, traveled around to these countries where I'm published in. It's a terrific market. It's great to see your book in other languages. Um, and in all those languages, my books have David Baldacci on them as being the author, except for one. One country and one language where I was forced to adopt a pseudonym, another name. My agent called me up from his office in New York one day, and he said, I have your Italian publisher in my office, Mondadori. They are the largest publisher in Italy, and they think absolute power will be a huge shit in that country, but they have a teeny problem with the name. Now, I thought he was referring to the title of the book. So I said, well, if they want to change absolute power, they can use another title. I mean, if you go to Germany and look for absolute power, you won't find it, because in Germany it's called De President. He said, well, no, no, they love the title. It translates beautifully into Italian. They have a problem with your name. <laughs> now, for those of you who thought that Baldacci was, I don't know, Irish, <laughs> it's not. You know, I'm Italian-American. I've got lots of vowels in my name. So I said to him, I said, uh, my Italian publisher has a problem with my Italian name? And he said, yes, it's a huge problem. I said, well, that's funny because, you know, the Koreans don't, the Chinese don't, the Dutch don't. I mean, everybody else sort of loves me. And he said, well, in Italy, it's very different. And I said, well, what is different in Italy? He said, well, it's a well-known fact that Italians don't believe that other Italians can write. <laughs> so I remember saying, well, that's strange because, you know, Dante, Machiavelli, and Puzo had pretty good careers, don't you think? He said, look, the bottom line is, like American films, foreign audiences want American thrillers. Anything less than that, they think, is sort of second or third tier. And other Italian-American writers like Steve Martini, who is Steve Martin in Italy, or Lisa Scottolini, who is Lisa Scott in Italy, if they see that Italian name on the cover, they're going to think you're an Italian-Italian and not a good writer, and they're not going to buy your book. So I said, well, that's humbling. What sort of name do they want? I asked him. And he said, well, you know, they want an American name. I said, well, did they realize that we're a country of immigrants? We're all from somewhere else. He said, I can understand you're upset about this. Why don't you just think about it and call me, call me in a few days? I said, no, no. You know what? If they're in your office right now, you give me five seconds, and I'll come up with the greatest American name you've ever heard. He said, okay. So I remember putting the phone down and going, oh, my God. You know, what do I do now? Well, luckily, I glanced out the window. And back then, we owned an Explorer. I remember looking at the blue plate. I picked the phone up and said, I want to be called David Ford. <laughs> so right away, my agent said, that sounds American. <laughs> my agent is quick, man. He is quick. <laughs> he actually is very quick. He said, let me try it out on the Italian. So I hear him telling the Italian guys that he wants to be called David Ford. Now, the next word I hear is from the chairman of Mondadori, who screams out the word so loudly, I can hear him, even though he's not even holding the phone. And the one word he screams out is, genius! <laughs> Italians are also very passionate, demonstrative people, as you gathered. So he put, gets back on the phone, and he said, my God, David, they love it. David Ford, it's perfect, perfect. How did you come up with that so fast? So with as much sincerity as I could muster, I said, hey, I'm a writer. <laughs> this stuff oozes off of me 24-7. <laughs> so David Ford hit number one in Italy. Now obviously, he's a very fine writer. And uh, my first book, I was David Ford. My second book, I was David, middle initial B, Ford. Why? I don't know. I got the winner, my third book, and I was David Baldacci Ford. They actually had to make the book wider, you know, to accommodate my name. And my fourth book and on, I'm only David Baldacci, so I guess people over there realize that I'm an Italian-American, not an Italian-Italian, and I can actually tell a story. So after all this is said and done, um, I went to Italy, and I met with the chairman of Mondadori, uh, the person who yelled out the word genius over the phone, and I was introduced to him. And you know what his name is? His name is Gianni Ferrari. <laughs> <laughs> I 
Now you know, if I wrote that in a book, that same woman on Amazon.com would get on and say, totally implausible, <laughs> far-fetched, we'll never read this author again. I hope you, could, uh, you can tell if you've read some of my books that I do a lot of research for them. I try to get it right, I go out, I talk to people, I read, I spend a lot of time sort of being an investigative reporter, I guess. And research is great, I think it makes for a better read, it certainly made for a better read in the collectors with the help of people at the Library of Congress. But sometimes research can get you into trouble. And I got into big trouble one time, uh, researching a book called Split Second. I was on, um, and it, it prompted me to write an acknowledgement in Split Second that I will quote to you in just a couple of minutes. I was on the Amtrak Acela train between Washington and New York. I was heading to New York uh, to meet with my publisher and doing some other things. And I'm sitting at one of those tables that you share with other people that you don't know. So I'm sitting over here and two businessmen I don't know were sitting across from me and they're doing all their businessman stuff, you know, Blackberries and computers, laptops, cell phones, everything. And I'm on my cell phone and I'm calling a medical examiner in New York who is a friend of mine. The only reason uh, is to make an appointment with her when I'm in New York so I could sit down and talk to her about some research that I wanted to do for the novel involving poisons. Unfortunately, she told me that she could not talk to me, she couldn't meet with me when I got up there because she was leaving the country in about four hours to go overseas on a special assignment and she would be back in about two weeks. So I could either wait until she got back or I could talk to her right now. I don't usually like to do these things over the phone, but I couldn't wait the two weeks for her to come back. It didn't really jive with my research schedule. So I said, well, you know, if this is the only time you could do it, let's just do it. So I had my questions and I, and I said, doctor, you know, this is basically how I want to murder the guy. And I went through my poisoning technique in great detail. <laughs> and I said, look, Doc, you know, there's going to be a police investigation because obviously this is a homicide, a suspicious death. I have to make certain the way I've killed him, the police won't even know a murder has been committed. They won't? Great. I'm writing that down. And I said, second point, you know there's going to be a postmortem done on the body, suspicious death. I need to make sure that I will be able to fool even someone like yourself, a medical examiner, into thinking that no crime has even been committed. Again, she said, they won't. I wrote that down. And then she went on, the medical examiner. She said, you know, I have often dreamed of killing people. <laughs> and she said, if I were going to do it, I would do it exactly the way you've done it, because it really is the perfect way to kill someone. And all I could say was, well, that's just high praise coming from you. I thank you very much. And I asked her a few more questions, and I said, finally, Doctor, um, I have to tell you, if I ever need to kill anybody else, I'm going to call you. <laughs> so I clicked off and finished writing up my notes and looked up. <laughs> this guy over here had spilled his coffee from his neck to his crotch. <laughs> this guy right across me was just looking at me like this. So the last acknowledgement in a split second, the acknowledgement section obviously is a place where you usually thank people for helping you on the book. In the acknowledgement section in a split second, the last one is an apology, and it goes something like this. To any and all passengers on the Amtrak Acela train who might have overheard me discussing with various experts poisoning techniques for purposes of researching the novel and were probably scared out of their wits at my seemingly diabolical intent, I apologize. <laughs> so I will never make that mistake again. Now, I was made aware of the Rare Book Reading Room uh, at my first trip to the National Book Festival, and the person who showed it to me was a guy named Jerry Wager, and he was a volunteer escort. He was my volunteer escort uh, for the National Book Festival. And unfortunately, Jerry passed away, but he talked so lovingly of the room um, with such passion and devotion to it that I always, in the back of my mind, and I tend to do this when people talk to me about things, I stick it in the back of my mind, but I don't forget it. And with the collectors, because of sort of the makeup of my Camel Club characters, because one of them, Caleb Shaw, works at the Rare Book Reading Room, having the Rare Book Reading Room sort of star in the collectors made great sense to me. I have to admit, when I first visited the vault um, and walked through it, I came out of it with one thought only. I have the perfect way to kill someone in that vault. And the way that I wrote it, um, you know, I guess it might work, but not the way you have it set up, so please don't panic. <laughs> It's okay for you to go in the vault. Although I, I've heard that they put a sign up in the vault now for a certain section that says, you know, do not enter this part of the vault because it may be dangerous. <laughs> I, have to, I have to say, um, researching the novel was made very easy for me by, you know, wonderful cooperation and friendship from the people at the Library of Congress. I'd like to 
thank John Cole for that, Mark Demination for that, Daniel De Simone, if he, is he here? Yes, Daniel De Simone. And, and Diane Van Der Raden, is she here? Yes. You need to know about these things, I think, to write uh, a good book. And my take on research is obviously less is best because I'm not writing a textbook. But I have to talk to people and read lots of material. It could be three or four books, three or 400 pages that will enable me to synthesize that information down into a paragraph that I then put into the book that sounds like I actually know what I'm talking about, and hopefully I do, at least to some extent. Because as a storyteller, as a novelist, if I allow the research to interfere with the flow of the story, I failed my job. I failed my craft because my job is to tell a story, not so much educate you on particular points, to inform you, but also to entertain you in a sort of a seamless stream of narrative. And that's what my job was to do. But with all the help that I had from people here at the Library of Congress, it really made my job easier because they brought the building, they brought the room, they brought the books to life for me. And I think because of their cooperation and their help and their friendship and, and guidance, it made the book a whole lot better than it otherwise would have been. Um, as part of the promotional tour this year for the book, we're sponsoring a contest. People can raffle, do a raffle, and the winner gets to come to the Library of Congress and go to the Rare Books Reading Room, um, talk to the people here. John, will, and John and I will sort of show them around and uh, let them see what a jewel it is. Because when I first walked into the Rare Book Reading Room, it struck me that it was such a very special place. I actually felt almost at home there. I wanted to sit down and pull out a book and start reading. I, I love looking at the lamps. I love looking at the walls. The doors fascinated me. The vaults were magnificent to go through and actually see books that Thomas Jefferson held. The literary treasures that are there for me were almost overwhelming. But if I'd gone through my life and never been to the place, I think there would have been a hole there. Even if I didn't know the rare book room even existed, I just would have sort of intuitively known that I should have gone to that place. And I hope others share that enthusiasm. You know, writing The Collectors um, was a joy for a couple of reasons. One, it brought back a group of guys, The Camel Club. For those of you who haven't read the book entitled The Camel Club, I'll give you a short sort of synopsis of these guys. I have written a lot of books about Washington, politics, thrillers, agencies, military, etc. But virtually all Washington thrillers are written from the same perspective, the same point of view, and that is from the inside looking out. Powerful people holding powerful positions, looking out at everybody else and sort of doing things behind the scenes. I wanted to write a book where the point of view was switched, reversed. I wanted to show people on the outside, people out of the mainstream, people who have no position or influence or power looking in at these folks to see what they may or may not be doing that might be in the interest of the country or might not be in the interest of the country. So I put together this sort of scrabble of characters. They're very quirky and idiosyncratic. And they're headed up by a guy who goes by the name Oliver Stone. You know, Not that he's conspiracy theory oriented, um, but maybe he might be a little bit. And he has these three other guys who are totally out of the mainstream that sort of help him. They're an unofficial watchdog organization to sort of see, you know, is government doing what government should be doing? Are there things going on that maybe there shouldn't be going on? And Oliver Stone, um, when I first moved to Washington, this is where this image came from. When I first moved to Washington, Lafayette Park was a different place. Pennsylvania Avenue was still open. You could drive up and down. And in Lafayette Park, they had people with tents and protesters. And I sort of always referred to them as the permanent protesters. I remember first walking by and um, seeing all these signs and tents. And obviously, some of these people were sort of crazy. I remember one guy, his only clothing were ties. He just had a bunch of ties sort of discreetly placed over his body. And, um, but part of me in the back of my mind thought, you know, what if not all of them weren't nuts? What if at least one of them was there for another reason? He was there to actually to do something good. He was actually there to watch his government, symbolically at least, and hold it accountable for things that it might be doing. And that's sort of the genesis years ago of where this character of Oliver Stone came from. And the execution of that idea came forth in the Camel Club and now in the Collectors. So that's these guys, Reuben Rhodes and Milton Farb and Caleb Shaw, who works at the Library of Congress, and Oliver Stone. And in the Collectors, um, there is an opening chapter that really opens with a bang. The Speaker of the House is assassinated at his club by a man who may or may not be working for the United States government. You really don't know it at that point, but it makes you think. Now the Camel Club comes into it because the director, the Rare Books Reading Room, meets with an unfortunate fate early on in the book, but lives on as a wonderful character <laughs> who was much loved and cherished, 
throughout the rest of the novel. So that's how they get involved um, in, in the mystery. Now, there are two main storylines uh, in, the, in the collectors. One is this thing's happening in Washington, the people dying and the Camel Club investigating. Then in another part of the country, there is a con artist, and I call her the most gifted con artist of her generation, Annabelle Conroy. And um, she is planning a huge scam. It's called a long con, which is one that takes place kind of like the Sting movie, where it takes place over time, and you have to develop it out. And she is going to rip off a casino owner in Atlantic City. A lot of money. And you wonder, well, how can these very disparate elements come together? You've got a Washington sort of political thriller going on, and you've got a con artist. Well, with a wave of my novelist fictional wand, you know, I'm able to devise a way for Annabelle to come to Washington, D.C. and join forces with the Camel Club against a greater evil. And it's amazing. Han Annabelle Conroy can talk out of both sides of her mouth. She can lie to your face, and you'll believe every word of it. I mean, she is just a wonderful sort of magician where she can make you believe anything, even though it's all totally a lie. She's full of deception and deceit, and that's just her character is. Ironically, she comes to Washington, D.C. and fits right in. So that is the premise for the collectors, and it moves forward from there. And again, it was wonderful writing the book. It was wonderful spending time down here, spending time in the vault, spending time talking to the folks down at the Library of Congress who gave me you know, a lot of access and a lot of advice and read pages of uh, the manuscript to make sure that I'd gotten everything the way it should be. Um, you know, suggested the base psalm book for the end papers and gave me so much help in a lot of uh, ways that I would never forget, and I just want to thank them very much for that. Now, the last thing I want to talk to you about is um, a few years ago, my wife Michelle and I uh, founded uh, the Wish You Well Foundation. And the Wish You Well Foundation uh, is the title of one of my books, but it only has one goal, and that's to eradicate illiteracy in the United States. And we fund programs across the country that try to do just that. Um, and we also bring organizations together, literacy organizations together to Together, sometimes they're more powerful and can have more of an impact than they can separately. And we also try to devise new programs that can be implemented across the country to help people read. As part of this tour and every tour that I'm going to do from now on, uh, the Wish You Well Foundation and Ashet Books, my publisher, have joined forces with America's Second Harvest, which runs the nation's food banks. A lot of the proposals, we sat in our offices one day over a foundation board meeting. And we have a board of directors, and we sat looking through these proposals that we get. And we get several proposals across the country for lots of different requests for money, for tutoring, for overhead, for services, for books, for uh, materials to teach people. But increasingly, we would get requests for a food component as well. And we would talk to these people because it's we didn't think we were in the food business. We thought we were into helping people learn how to read. And in talking with a lot of these organizations, they would say, well, you know, sometimes our organization, when they come there, it's the only meal they're going to have that day. And I have long known of the ties between, obviously, poverty and illiteracy. But that really brought the point home clearly to all of us. So at that board meeting, we came up with the idea of this idea. Every time I do a book signing, and when I go out there, there will be a huge box there labeled Food Bank, America's Second Harvest, and Wish You Well Foundation. And people who come to my book signing or come to that bookstore are encouraged to bring new books, buy books at the bookstore, not just mine, any book they want, or bring used books from home, because how many of us have books sitting at home we've never read, we'll never read again, they're just sitting there, and put in that box. And that box is full, it will be boxed up and sent to that area's local food bank. So when people walk in the door to get a meal, they will get a meal and they will walk out the door with their bellies full and books in their hand. And for a lot of people, it may be the only books they will ever get from any source at all. Now, we're going to take this much bigger. Um, Ashet authors are going to start doing this in mass next year at all of their book signings. And then we're going to go to all the other major publishers and minor publishers, I don't care, in the United States. My dream is that within a year, anytime, anywhere in this country, an author is out doing a book signing, there's going to be a food bank box there where people can fill up that box with books and they will go to the area of food bank, and people will be able to walk out of that place with a meal and with books. I mean, I know how much high literacy ability has meant to me in my life. I wouldn't be standing here in the Library of Congress's Madison building talking to you about my 12th book if I didn't have the ability to read quite well. But a lot of people don't have that ability. You know, the last thing I want is to a child to walk into a food bank tomorrow with their parents to get food, and 20 years from now, that same child as an adult walks into another food bank with his or her kids in tow. You never can break that cycle of poverty, and you can't break that cycle of illiteracy. But we have to break it. We have to break it. You know, you need food to live, but books can change your life. 
And that's what we need to do. We need to bring those two together at the same source, and that's what we're going to try to do. I've spent a lot of years studying literacy and going around the country doing a lot with it. Both my wife and I have done that. There are 300 million people in the United States now. That just happened, I think, this morning. You know, the 300 million person, as they said, either was born or crossed the border. Take your pick. <laughs> there are roughly 190 million adults in the United States. And about 95 million of them read at the two lowest levels of literacy. So half the adult population in this country is basically functionally illiterate. That is a staggering number. That is a number you would expect in a third world country, not in the United States of America. 60% of inmates, 90% of juvenile offenders, half the people on welfare, the poverty issue again, are all illiterate. The ties to those social ills are indisputable. Now, the cost of this country is not millions or billions or hundreds of billions. The cost of this country and those wasted lives and that not realizing the potential of those millions of people, the cost of this country is trillions of dollars. Even if you don't care about the dollar amounts, it's tens of millions of lives that are wasted, totally wasted, because they can't read. They don't have that one fundamental skill. Now, why is reading so important? I can stand up and tell you a lot of reasons. It's not just so you can read a book and have fun on your vacation while you're at the beach. But if you think about it, and I have thought about these things for a lot over time, a democracy, is grounded, is built on the fact that we will have a well-read, literate, opinionated population. If we don't, a democracy cannot be sustained. It can't be. Historically, it's been proven it cannot be. Our three greatest rights of Americans are all tied to words. We have the freedom of speech, we have the freedom of the press, and we have the right to exercise of religious freedom. You take away one, we are no longer a democracy. You take away two, we are firmly and clearly a dictatorship. The margin of error there is not nearly as wide as people tend to think that it is. A population that doesn't read newspapers ever, why should they respect the right to a free press? Why does it matter to them? The people who have their opinion spoon-fed to them instead of thinking about it themselves, at the end of the day, why do they care about free speech? They've already been told what to think. If you look at historically examples over time, an illiterate population, an unopinionated population, a population that looks to others for the vision of what they're supposed to believe is a manipulated population. A manipulated population, historically, only bad things happen to nations that have a manipulated population. And an illiterate population is one that is eminently capable of being manipulated. I was reading an article a few months ago, and they did a story, an in-depth story on dictators. And they listed, like, ranked and worst dictators in the world, one through 30, or God help us, one through 30, the worst dictators in the world. And they found that, in all due deference to Mr. Shakespeare, that dictators don't first kill all the lawyers. You know? Some people in this room may think, well, they should. <laughs> but they don't. What dictators do, 100% of the time, when they take power, and you will relate to this better than anyone else, any other group I will ever speak to on the point. The first thing that dictators do is they shut down all the libraries. That's the very first thing that they do. They don't want people going to libraries. The answer, obviously, is libraries are filled with books. Books are filled with ideas. Ideas represent a diversity of opinion. A diversity of opinion is something that an oppressive regime fears more than even the most powerful army in the world. Because diversity of opinion and ideas means that change in a country can come from within that country, not from without. And as we all know, internal change through the people of a nation makes for the most lasting, permanent, and fundamental change that there is. And that's why they fear libraries and books and reading so much. Now, if we solve every other problem that we have as a nation, but we don't eradicate illiteracy, it's not going to matter. It's not going to matter. Because the country we know and love today cannot exist in the form that we want it to. It's impossible. Now, growing up, I read a lot of books, and I'm sure all of you did as well. And books can change your life, and they have changed my life. And I will tell you about one book that has changed my life, and then we can open the floor for questions. This book really did change my life dramatically. I practiced law in Washington for almost 10 years, and for most of that time, I worked at a small 
firm where I knew all the other lawyers, knew all the clients in the firm, and I felt really good about that. You were like an entrepreneur, and uh, it just was a much more collegial atmosphere. My last year in practice, my little firm was gobbled up by this huge firm. So I didn't, I came, changed from being David Baldacci, the attorney, to attorney 587, you know, in this big firm. And at this big firm, I was assigned to work with a senior partner on an acquisition. Our client was buying another company. And it was amicable, so that wasn't a problem. Well, the senior partner was described to me as one of the most anal men in America. Now, lawyers, you may be surprised to know, can be a little anal about things. You know, they're very detail-oriented, and they like, that. they like to fuss over stuff like that. So he was described to me as probably the most anal lawyer in America. I remember that on his, he never wrote in pen, he only had a box of pencils on his desk. And if the sh points were really sharp, they would be pointed up. Once they got a little bit dull, he would flip them over so the eraser was showing, and that was a cue for his secretary to rush in and sharpen them for him. So I worked with this guy on this acquisition, and he asked me one day to call up the attorney on the other side and confirm that three facts were true. So I called the attorney up on the other side on the phone, and I asked him, is this true, is this true? And he gave me the answers, and I wrote it up in a memo, which is what you do in big firms. And I sent it to this partner, and about three minutes later, he called me up on the phone, and he said, did you write this memo? And he read it to me, and I said, well, yeah, I mean, it's got my name on it. It came from me. I wrote it. He said, come to my office immediately. So I went down to his office, and big corner office. I went in, he closed the door, we sit down. He said, read this memo to me. I said, uh, I called attorney so-and-so and received a verbal representation that the following three facts were true. He said, okay. You called him on the phone? I said, yeah, I called him on the phone. You received a verbal representation that those facts were true? I said, yeah, I did. He said, okay. Tell me, he asked, do you know the difference between oral and verbal? And I remember looking at him and finally I said, well, quite frankly, in my whole life, I've never had occasion to think about that. But if I were to think about it, I guess oral would mean spoken language, whereas verbal could encompass spoken language, but also sounds, noises, a grunt from a monkey could be verbal. He said, exactly. You didn't receive a verbal representation. You received an oral representation. I don't tolerate imprecision in my attorneys. Please don't ever let that happen again. So the whole time he's talking to me, you know, the theme song for the Twilight Zone <laughs> is like wafting through the back of my mind. We all have to deal with unpleasant situations in life. We all do. And you deal with it, and you, and you move on as best you can. He was a senior partner. I was in the only position to jump up and start screaming at him. And I said, look, I am really sorry for the oral verbal snafu thingy. <laughs> I was incredibly stupid on my part to do, and I'm, I'm sorry. And I certainly won't let it happen again, because I have the oral verbal thing down <laughs> now. So I left, and I thought, okay, well, you know, unpleasant. Guy's kind of wacky, but there you go. It was over. Well, it wasn't over. I went back to my office, and about an hour later, I get two items from this gentleman in the inner office mail. One, I have no idea where he found it, but he found a page in a book, and he had it blown up and put like on poster board. And it said, how to tell the difference between oral and verbal, and it gave me eight helpful bullet points to make the differentiation so that, you know, idiots like me wouldn't make that mistake in the future. And then he sent me a book, and the book's title was how to write well. I thought it was a little overkill, <laughs> you know, for the verbal oral snafu thingy. Well, the very next day, uh, my first novel, Absolute Power, sold to what was then Warner Books for the record most money ever paid for a first novel in North American publishing history. It was a nice day for me. And I remember sort of fibbing to my firm that I was sick or something, and I went up to New York, and they threw me a party, and it was great, and I signed the contracts, and Clint Eastwood bought the film rights, and 14 countries bought foreign rights to it that very day while I was in New York, and people I didn't even know were like throwing checks at me, you know? Not bad. I will take that. Well, while I was up there, my plan was, when I got back the next day to Washington, to sort of explain to my firm, who had no idea who I even was, I had just joined the firm, about my writing career. I'd writ written in the middle of the night, 16, 17 years, and I'd been working on this novel, and it, it sold, you know, and hopefully they would understand. While I was in New York at my agent's office, 
all this stuff was happening, he put a copy of a newspaper article under my face, and I read it, and it had a little character drawing of me and the whole story about the book, me, the sale, et cetera. And I said, where, where's the story from? He said, it was in today's Wall Street Journal. Every law firm in the world gets their Wall Street Journal. <laughs> so I remember I grabbed the phone, and I called my secretary in Washington, and I said, you know, by chance, has anybody maybe happened upon this story? And she said, oh, my God, David, the whole firm is shut down. All 11 offices across the country. Everybody's out in the hallway, and they're reading this article, and they're saying, who the hell is attorney 587? <laughs> that must have been some book that guy wrote. Well, I got back to Washington the next day, and I went to my firm. Obviously, I still work there. And explained my story, and people were very you know, complimentary, encouraging, um, said, you know, great job. It was very nice, very nice reaction. And I went back to my office, and I sat down, and I saw that book you know, my, on my desk. And I, kept, I looked at that book for probably 30 minutes. I had to write well. And finally I decided, you know what, David, you will never have another chance like this in your whole life. <laughs> you won't. <laughs> so I took that book. And I went down to the big senior partner's office and knocked on his door. I went in. He was behind his desk. He had read the newspaper article. He knew I probably wasn't going to be working there much longer. <laughs> but, you know, with as much sincerity as I could muster, I held that book up and I said, I just wanted you to know how much this book has changed my life. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you, David. That was terrific. David has agreed to uh, answer a few questions. And uh, if you ask a question, and we hope you do, you're also giving the library permission to tape you, and you'll have the pleasure later, perhaps, of looking on the website and seeing how your question was answered. With that, I'd like to turn it back to David, and he will uh, also repeat the question once you ask it. David? Anybody have any questions? Mark might have one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. Uh, the, the question deals with the unfortunate demise of the director of the rare books and special collections. You know, it was interesting. I think um, he meets his death on page 33. Uh, originally, it was on page 15. Uh, so I gave him about 16 or 17 more pages of life, which I thought was, you know, that was nice. It was, it was a close call. You know, as a writer, you sort of play God with your book, who lives, who dies. And uh, my problem was I needed a catalyst for the story really to take off. And unfortunately, his death was the catalyst to really take off. The fact that um, he did live on throughout the rest of the book and um, was spoken of highly throughout, throughout, and obviously was a real reason why one of the main characters was even involved in the story at all, um, means uh, that you know pretty much absolutely nothing as far as the future he might have in another book, unfortunately. <laughs> Uh, that's just the way it goes. But if there's a way that I can work him in, you know, I will work him in. I'm sure, you know, there's going to be Caleb Shaw is going to be the next book. Um, there will undoubtedly be a wonderful portrait of, of him coming into the rare books room to remember him by. <laughs> and, uh, and never let it be said that I don't take care of my characters. <laughs> yes, ma'am. You know what, I've, I've already, I'll, I'll repeat the question, but I've already had this question from another reader, so I, I obviously know that I messed up there. Um, in the first chapter, um, the assassination of the Speaker of the House is a very elaborately planned sort of thing by a man who knows what he's doing. And he has like several layers of subterfuge where he's able to kill the Speaker of the House and then get away using, he, and he changes his disguises like twice in a span of maybe a minute. He goes from being a killer to a police officer to a jogger. And as he's jogging along with his dog, 
Um, the dog is just a prop, really. So the police who are chasing the, would, the killer won't even look at him because you see joggers all the time with the dogs. You wouldn't think a jogger with a dog running down the street that just assassinated the Speaker of the House. Just not going to occur to most police officers or anyone. Um, the dog is doing fine. Um, <laughs> What I didn't say, you know, I write screenplays too, so this really would have been offstage direction. Uh, the dog is doing fine. He's actually living with me. Um, <laughs> and he's a golden Labradoodle. His name is Finnegan. He's a beautiful dog. He's eating very well. And he's very playful. Um, if you would like to come over and see him sometime, that would be fine. <laughs> other uh, contemporary writers who've influenced me over the years growing up. I remember in high school um, devouring John Irving work. And um, for years, I wanted to sort of write like John Irving, these huge tomes, multi-generational, with these broad plot lines, huge cast of characters. And, uh, but you know, only John Irving can write like John Irving. I remember uh, growing up reading the likes of Garrison Keillor and the humor of the Lake Wobegon series was amazing to me. Ann Tyler and John Updike, I devoured the Rabbit series one after another as soon as they came out. John Updike, the turn of phrase, the comedic timing, which comedic timing is, is difficult to do, particularly for literary fiction. You don't find it often in literary fiction, unfortunately. But laughter can be a strong statement. And as you probably noticed in my remarks, tonight. I made serious points, but I also hopefully made you laugh and you were amused. And that was done for a very real reason. Most people will remember a serious point if you attach a bit of humor to it. And hopefully when you walk out of the room, you remember some of the funny stories that I told and then also segue into some of the more serious points that I elaborated upon. Um, I tell people, um, you know, growing up in the South, you have to read the likes of Walker Percy, Eudora Welty, Mark Twain, Truman Capote, Harper Lee, and I read all of them. Um, I am astonished that Mark Twain isn't read in more schools these days. I've gone to high schools and talked to kids and said, what do you think about Mark Twain? And they have no idea who I'm talking about. Mark Twain um, is one of those rare writers who can write about the most serious elements of society in the most memorable ways and make you laugh. And for those who have never attempted that, it's one of the hardest things a writer can do. Most writers can't do it. I mean, I still read Mark Twain over and over again. And 160 years after he wrote the words, I still laugh at them. How many comedians do you know that can tell a joke 160 years later, the same joke, and you would still laugh at it? That's the power of putting words in a certain order in a way that is truly, absolutely timeless. So as a writer, I think I mentioned this in the beginning of my remarks, I'm only a writer because I love to read. When I would read a book, whether it be by any of the authors that I mentioned or others, what captured me was that this person has me enthralled with little printed symbols on a page. How can that possibly be? These days, we seem to be much more intrigued with visual stimulus, or auditory stimulus, movies, and cell phones with special ringers, and <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, David. Anyway, <laughs> little printed symbols on a page. How could that possibly impress anyone? Well, it can if you know what you're doing. It can if you put those little symbols in just the right order. This building and the building across the street is filled with those types of books. And I wanted to have that same effect over other people. I wanted to be able to take these printed symbols, place them on a piece of paper, and have people glued to those pages because they bought into everything I was telling them, even though none of it was true. You know, one of the greatest compliments I've ever had as a writer, I wrote a novel called Wish You Well. It was not a thriller. It was set in 1940 in Southwest Virginia. A lot of reviewers compared it to To Kill a Mockingbird. I never would because, for me, Mockingbird is sort of up here, head and shoulders above everything else. But the reader uh, wrote in and said, you know, I, I was reading about Lou Cardinal and her father, who were very accomplished writers in the book. And... I have gone to every bookstore, I've gone to Amazon.com, I've gone to Barnes & Noble, I cannot find their books anywhere. And the way you describe them, I know they must be absolutely terrific writers, I want to get their books, can you tell me where I can go to get their books? And I had to very gently and diplomatically write back to this person and say, you have just flattered me beyond belief, 
that characters I created out of my imagination and put into these little printed symbols you believe were real, but they weren't. But I said, you know what, they're real to you, and actually they're real to me, so it's okay. We'll just have a real-to-real -real club, <laughs> and that'll be just fine. That's a good word. Well, um, to summarize the question, the fact that people, uh, half the adults in the United States, are read at low, very low literacy levels. 45 million are completely illiterate. Another 45, 50 million read at level two, which means they could read a grocery list that's two items long. If you give them a word, they can pick it out of a newspaper story. They have no idea what the story means. They can't read directions. That's level two literacy, not level one. Level one is no ability to read at all. If people don't care about that skill, and we have you know, problems with people understanding math, and we have jo jobs being sent to other countries that have better educated populations, what is that going to do for this country? The answer, quite frankly, is it, it tends to be sort of a doomsday scenario, if you think about it. I don't want to be, I don't want to live in a country where the majority of people can't read, or never do, or don't care about reading. It's not the act of reading. Reading is to live. It's the only way you can live. Imagine all of your lives today, and things that you have to do every day, the things you read, assimilate, synthesize, think about, make a decision on, and then act upon that decision. Do all of the things you do every day and not be able to read. Could you function in your job? You couldn't. Not only could you not function in your job, you could not function in your private life either. And the sorts of trends that we see coming. Have you ever wondered why this country seems to be so neatly divided down the middle? You look on those maps that I hate that shows blue on the outsides and reds on the inside. How can a country of 300 million people think in only two ways? How is that possible? Shouldn't we have millions of different types of opinions and thoughts and philosophies and reasons about why we're doing what we're doing as a country? If we have two ways, does that tend to show that maybe people are being manipulated in how they're thinking about stuff, being spoon-fed, what they're supposed to think? I change my mind about things every day. Because I read about stuff, I listen to people, I synthesize, I make up my own mind. But I go back and forth all the time with it. I don't believe lockstep A, B, C, D, E. Historically, those examples have been disasters. Fo blindly following the vision of other people has been at the epicenter of every man-made catastrophe in the history of this world. 100% of the time. Adolf Hitler in Germany, Stalin in Russia. People who fly planes in the buildings in New York City, blindly following the vision of other people without thinking about it for themselves. That's what happens from that. That's why all we can do is chip away the best we can. You have programs like Wish You Well and a million other private foundations, public sector help. I think a difference of priorities in this country would be nice. We spend more on defense in this country, and we are... We are deemed to be a peace-loving country, and I think that for the most part we are. We spend more on defense in this country than every other major country in the world combined. $500 billion a year is a lot. Considering the rest of the budget, when you take out all the entitlement programs, is only about $170 billion for everything. $500 billion on rockets and bombs and troops and tanks and planes and ships. It makes... Lockheed and Boeing and Halliburton very happy, but I'm not sure what it's doing for the core infrastructure of this country. Core infrastructure meaning the people. One more question and then I'll get off my soapbox. I'm sorry, but uh, sometimes, you know, it does get to you. Yes, ma'am.
with, <clears throat> with the story. The question is, with, with the novel, where you do a lot of research, you have pack a lot of information into that novel. Um, am I trying to be strictly accurate with all of the facts? Am I just bound by plausibility as a novelist? Am I trying to impart more than just the strict, naked accuracy of those facts? Am I trying to lead people down you know, to another path, another direction, trying to inform them a little bit beyond just entertaining them? Is that, you can tell I was a trial lawyer, right? You know, this is what you have to do. And I try to, with every book to entertain, but also inform people. As a novelist, I am only bound by plausibility. If it could happen once in a million times, that's enough for me. If it could happen once in a hundred times, that's certainly enough for me. I'm only bound by plausibility. And I gotta tell you, these days what's plausible is a lot higher than it used to be. I find myself fighting with the headlines every day. This is a great idea for a novel, would never happen. Washington Post, oh, it happened, wow. How about that, I've gotta go look somewhere else. But you know, with that said, I try to be fair with the facts. Um, and I try to give both sides, tri sides, quad sides of opinions. I don't want to be hammering down on one side or the other. You know, with the Camel Club, I gave a different perspective on the world today, really. And every Washington thriller you've probably ever read, if you've, if you've read many or read any at all, um, it's good versus bad, you know, good versus evil, and the lines are clearly marked. And that's just the way that it is. Well, that's not the way that it is. The world is not run by black and white. The world is run by gray. And the city that we all are standing in right now is the king of gray. It's where a lot of it emanates from. The world is far more complicated than good versus evil will ever encompass. It doesn't work that way. The factors involved are far too complex and sophisticated. So for me as a novelist, you know, I tell the story. I throw out a lot of information. Um, some of it you can accept as fact, but you keep in mind that I'm a fiction writer, and I can take those facts and sort of turn them this way and that, and skew your prism that you're looking through. As, an, as a fiction writer, you have to be a couple of things, three things actually. You have to be a writer, obviously. You have to be a magician, and you have to be a psychologist. As a writer, you have to write. As a magician, as a thriller writer, I have to be fair with you. So I have to show you everything. If I'm gonna foreshadow something, I need to show it to you because if it's a payoff later, I don't wanna hide it from you. Agatha Christie wrote great books, but she wasn't really fair with that. She hit a lot of stuff and all of a sudden you'd pop up with a character with, oh, I never knew he had a twin. You know, that sort of thing. Wish you had told me that, you know, the preceding 300 pages. With me, I try to show it all to you, but I don't necessarily want you to focus on it. So if I'm showing you some information over here that you have to know, but I don't want you to really focus on, I do something fascinating over here. And you're kind of like, and it's gone. But it was there. The psychologist part comes in that I have to know re what readers are going to, how they're going to react to something that I've written. If I write a sentence, I have to know what impact it's going to have on you. Is it going to make you hate this character, like this character, be suspicious of this character? Or are you sort of going to follow this person along? You think he's absolutely good, absolutely going to make it through the whole book and not die on page 33? So I have to know when I write it, how are you going to read that? What's your reaction going to be from the reader? Because I need to know that to make sure that my story is going to go the way I think it's going to go. If you read right through a subterfuge that I've devised and you figure out who did it, why they did it, when they did it, and all that, on page 17, I got a problem. And you would be justified going on to Amazon.com <laughs> and trying to give me a zero star for that. Okay, thank you very much. I'd like to thank David for <coughs> sharing so much of himself with us, not only as a writer, but his uh, humor, uh, his, the book that he's written, the way that he has presented his ideas to us tonight. Uh, part of every Books and Beyond talk is time to meet with the author and to get your book signed. And what we're going to do is to, I'm going to lead David off the stage over to the other room and we'll get him settled in the corner and we'd like a line to be formed. and we'll have a chance to uh, chat with him and get your book signed. But please uh, join me one more time in uh, thanking David Baldacci for a wonderful <laughs> evening. Uh, before, you, before we head out, I'd like to, we had special uh, limited editions, leather bound editions done of The Collectors. And Shet was wonderful enough to do that and I really appreciated it. Um, it's, it's great. 
beautiful book, and considering it's called The Collectors, it makes for a nice collector's item. I would like to uh, donate this book, this copy, to the Library of Congress. It will not end up next to Jefferson stuff in the Rare Book Reading Room, I know that. But believe me, the donation is very heartfelt by me. And again, I thank you very much for the help that all of you have given me in writing this book. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.